Okay, so um, uh, welcome back. Uh, uh, so I'm going to start, uh, I kind of cheated a bit, I started writing before you arrived. Uh, I'm going to recall uh, a bit of what we did uh, so in the first lecture, so you know, to refresh memories. So uh, in the first lecture, uh, I gave a rigorous probabilistic definition to the Liouville correlation functions. <coughs> and so uh, what did I do? So just to refresh memories, uh, I introduced uh, you know, the main parameter of the theory, which is gamma, which in all these lectures belongs to the interval 0, 2. I introduced Q equals gamma over 2 plus 2 over gamma, so it's a, a function of gamma. And I introduced so uh, the cosmological constant mu, which is a positive parameter, which it's just a scale, uh, it's, it, it just appears in this scale relation here. So it's not an Im important parameter of the theory. But nonetheless, it's essential for the existence of the theory. <clears throat> but it's kind of a, a trivial uh, parameter in some sense. So what I, what I did last time is I, I justified that if you have the bounds up there, so here I'm calling them the extended Seiberg bounds. Uh, so sometimes this is how we, we call it, and so I define the product of, so in the path integral language. So remember, these are, so these are the, should be seen as, you know, something like this in the path integral language, but, okay, I'll justify this in lecture three and, and, and show why these correlations are, can be interesting to study uh, from the random planner map perspective, for instance. So I define the, the product of, of these fields, so with weight alpha k and in the point zk in the complex plane. So I define the correlations of these, of these fields as 2, so this mu to the power minus s, where s is given by this thing upstairs, upstairs uh, gamma of s, the, gamma, the standard gamma function in the complex plane, times this product here, which is, you know, a, the Gaussian free field part of the theory, and times the interesting part of the theory, the interesting uh, piece of the theory, which is an expectation of, and so this is what I wrote above. So under these extended Seiberg bounds, then I can define this thing here. Okay, so it's the integral of the Gaussian multiplicative measure, uh, random, or random volume form, integrated against a function and what is this function? It is a function which essentially has singularities around each point zk, and these singularities, their, uh, let's say their, their, their intensity or their magnitude is, is given by these coefficients alpha k. Okay, and so the extended Seiberg bounds up there, just to, okay, let me recall a few, a few things. So the extended Seiberg bounds ensure that this thing here, is non-trivial. It's between zero and plus infinity strictly. Okay, so if I write it in with, uh, so usually uh, in the lecture notes I introduce this notation and the extended Seiberg bounds are for all k, alpha k smaller than q, so remember gamma over 2 plus 2 over gamma, and minus s strictly less than 4 over gamma square infimum of 2 over gamma q minus alpha. Okay, so these are the extended Seiberg bounds. So if alpha k is above or equal to q, the Gaussian multiplicative chaos measure, it, 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 it explodes. So uh, this bound comes from the fact that if I integrate, say, around a point, so if alpha is greater or equal to q, if I integrate my exponential of free field, I get infinity, so almost surely. So say in a, a ball of radius 1 or radius whatever, the singularity is too strong and, and it can't integrate it anymore. So this is the, where the first bound comes from. And then, so if, if I have this, essentially depending on if minus s is positive or negative, I get an expectation which is zero or infinity. So, of course, I can make sense of this, but it's not the right object, okay? It's not the, rate, the right way to construct the Newville correlations. Uh, 
Uh, and so in the probabilistic approach, it's, it's, a, it's a trivial thing. And these bounds came from the fact that uh, <coughs> uh, I explained to you that if I take, say, if I integrate a Gaussian chaos measure in, in some open set, so say some ball uh, of radius r and center z, any point, then the, the moments exist if and only if p is strictly less than 4 over gamma squared. And then this, these, this bound here comes from the fact that when I put you know, a singularity around a point, uh, the moments of this variable exist if and only if it is smaller than uh, 4 over gamma squared, but especially uh, infimum 2 over gamma q minus alpha, where alpha is the... So it's just a condition to ensure that I can, I'm allowed to take the moment of this variable. I have to look at what happens around each singularity here. And I have to look also, say, uh, away from a singularity that everything's okay. Okay, so that's the, that's what I, 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 I kind of, okay, maybe it was a bit abrupt, uh, or, I mean, <laughs> direct, but I, I, I introduced directly these, these correlation functions. Uh, I set this as a definition and I, I tried to show to you why, you know, where these bounds come from. Okay, so today, uh, something that was maybe not that clear, uh, on Wednesday, on, on you know, in the first lecture, is uh, I said that n is greater or equal to three, but uh, in fact I, I I didn't really explain why. It's just that, and this is the computation I'm going to do in, in front of you, is if I look at okay, I wrote them down here. If I look at these two conditions, this implies n greater or equal to three. That's the point. And this is what I'm going to develop today, explain to you why, and then, okay, how do you do to define nonetheless a two-point correlation function? And when I try to define a two-point correlation function, you know, the, the material of the uh, mating of trees paper by Duplantier Miller Sheffield uh, will, 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 will enter the game. Okay, so um, let me first uh, just give you back the definition of, you know, the three-point correlation function, uh, because I'm going to be working on it. Uh, Okay, so in the case of, um, so I defined, let me, let me define the, the three-point correlation function. So I can also send one point to infinity. So here the z k's are in the complex plane, but I can send one to infinity, say this one. And uh, okay, it, it comes out of a, a scaling relation that's in, if, if I send the third point to infinity, I have to renormalize to get something, so delta 3, and so Z, I also, so in the lecture notes, this is denoted C of alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, but you can also denote it quite naturally like this. So this was my, my, my so in the lecture notes, I, I note, I set this equal to this. And I had this explicit expression, so this is, I'll be working on this explicit expression. So mu minus s, where s is, you know, the sum of the alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 minus 2q for gamma, gamma of s. Expectation. So I, I set this kind of definition with I, I send one point to infinity, and what do I get? I get this. Okay. All right. So that was the definition of the three-point correlation function, where one point is sent to infinity. And the, at the end of the last lectures, I explained what was the main theorem that we proved, and that is a uh, you know, the purpose of these lectures is to prove that this thing, uh, this expectation is uh, the same, uh, has an explicit expression, uh, which is called the DOZZ formula. Okay, so uh, let me try to explain now, 
So, uh, of course, okay, I can, I, we, we define the, the three-point correlation function under these conditions, and let me try to argue, uh, it's rather easy, why there's no two-point correlation function. So, because in fact it never really appeared in, in, in the first lectures. So, if you want to define a two-point correlation function, say you're, you, 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 the first thing you do is you set alpha 2 to 0, for instance, okay? So, uh, and you try to, and you look at the bounds. So what are the bounds? The bounds are alpha 1 smaller than q, alpha 2 smaller than q, and uh, if I look, 2q minus alpha 1, sorry, I'm, uh, let's say I'm taking alpha 2 to 0. So here, here are the bounds. So 4 over gamma, infimum 2q minus alpha 1, 2q minus alpha 2. Okay, so these, these are the bounds that I have to satisfy to define the two-point correlation function. Now what does this imply? This implies that this guy here is smaller than this. So saying that this is smaller than this, it's very easy to see that, so this smaller than this implies, well, uh, let me get it right, alpha 1 smaller than alpha 3, right? This is the same thing. And so, of course, this guy, smaller than this guy here, well, it's the other bound. It's alpha 3 smaller than alpha 1. So, the, of course, you, you see it's obvious there's a contradiction. You can't have both of these strict inequalities. And in fact, it shows something more. It shows that, okay, that if alpha 1 is different than alpha 3, then for all, okay, for all epsilon, or at least for epsilon small, okay, then for epsilon small, then for epsilon positive and small, alpha 1, epsilon alpha 3 does not satisfy the, the, extended, the extended Seiberg bounds. So, okay, maybe I'm going to put in, well, let me write in the extended Seiberg bounds. Okay, so that's one first. However, and this is, uh, you know, the, the, somehow the key observation if you want. If, if I choose alpha in the interval gamma over 2q, okay, then, so this is a non-trivial interval, right, because this is gamma over 2 plus 2 over gamma, then, okay, then 4 over gamma is bigger than 2q minus alpha, so that's a, I let you do the algebra, and uh, so what we have to look for is, and for all epsilon strictly positive, uh, alpha, epsilon alpha, does satisfy. Okay, so it does satisfy the extended Seiberg bounds. So this means that I can, so it's an easy uh, computation. This is bigger than this, then if I look at this, the condition is 2q minus 2 alpha minus epsilon smaller than 2q minus alpha, and this is obvious for all epsilon strictly positive. And so this means that I can define, so conclusion of my discussion, v alpha, if alpha is in here, v alpha zero, v, so what would be zero, okay, the, the, the two-point correlation function if you wish, this is infinity, however, for all epsilon strictly positive, v alpha 0, v epsilon 1, v alpha infinity, well, exists. So it's a, it's a, it's a three-point correlation function which, it ex which exists. Okay, so it, it means that we can define, for uh, if we take the same weights, we can define three-point correlation. And now we, of course, uh, the natural thing to do if you want to define a two-point correlation function is to 
renormalize this guy, take the limit and see uh, if, if the limit exists. And that's the main purpose of today's uh, lecture. Okay? And so the, the answer will be you get something called the, the reflection coefficient in Uville, and which can be interpreted as the, the partition function of, uh, of the quantum sphere measure introduced in, in Duplantier Miller Sheffield. Okay, so <coughs> let me start by. Um, um, so I want to keep this, right? So I think I'm going to keep this, this thing here right now. And I'm going to erase my definitions. Uh, anyways, you have the lecture notes for, for this. And do I have. I have to. Uh, here it is. So let me jump straight away to in the lecture notes what is called uh, what is goes under the name of lemma 3.4. So I'm going to prove directly lemma 3.4 by by first you know assuming something that is completely non-trivial. But so lemma 3.4, the Liouville reflection coefficient. So for all alpha. In gamma over 2q for r alpha. So, okay, this is a, some normalization. It's like linked to the 2 in the definition. It's, it's because at the end you want to match with uh, the DOZZ formula of physics, but I mean, it's, it's not important. I can define the limit as epsilon goes to 0 of epsilon c gamma, so the three point correlation function. Uh, so, I, okay, this is. Okay, in the notations of the lecture notes, I, I chose to call, when I have one point at infinity, I chose to call this, you know, the three-point structure constant. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry, everywhere, of course, with respect to the lecture notes, I have to put a gamma and a mu. All these quantities depend on gamma and on mu. Okay, so, I'm sorry, I, I let you, in your mind, correct, uh, put, so this thing, of course, C gamma also depends on mu, but uh, we, 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 didn't, we didn't stress the dependence in, on mu. Maybe we should have in our papers. Well, the, the dependence on mu is, is essentially trivial, so sometimes we don't, we don't stress its dependence. So this thing exists, and it converges to something which has a, a nice probabilistic expression. Okay, so it gives a, so this thing appears uh, in the bootstrap approach to Liouville very often, and, and what we get here, what this theorem will provide is a, a nice probabilistic expression to the two-point correlation function. So I'm going to give a proof of this by first, you know, uh, taking a, 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 for granted a, a, a completely non-trivial thing. So I'm going to introduce, so proof. Okay, so the proof is, goes this way. <clears throat> so, um, so a whole of alpha epsilon alpha. So remember, I'm taking the expectation of this guy to 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 some to some power. Let's take my lecture notes. The statement of the lemma is the limit exists, and, I, and R alpha is going to be defined in some way I'm going to explain. So lemma is, okay, I, I, I went kind of backwards compared to the notes. I wanted to, it's, this limit exists, and, uh, and, and then I'm going to spend an hour, the, 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 the end of these lectures, giving you a, you know, a probabilistic expression to this. So first, okay, it's going to be, so yes, the statement of the lemma as I'm stating it here right now in front of you is this limit exists. And it's, and it's, it's non-trivial. Yes, uh, it's a, a non-trivial, uh, okay. Uh, I, I can multiply by epsilon square and limit exists. Okay, sorry. So 
Let me explain how you prove this. So C gamma of alpha epsilon alpha is equal to 2 mu, so 2 over gamma q minus alpha minus epsilon over gamma, so a constant. The gamma function times, so this is always the interesting part, so it's, you know, it's all this, the first trivial part of the, so it's this thing here, I'm just, and the expectation of whole alpha epsilon alpha to the power 2 over gamma q minus alpha minus epsilon over gamma and this thing, this random variable, it's this. So I have an, so remember this is the, the, the this is the maximum, uh, yes, the maximum between x and 1. So, uh, sorry, so what I mean is that this thing, the expectation part is, you know, I'm just copying what I did there, but in a, a specific case, it's given by this thing, and what I want to really register you know, is this formula for, the, for the, the moment. So, of course, when epsilon goes to zero, this goes trivially to, okay, mu to this power, this goes to gamma evaluated here, so uh, everything is about trying to understand what this random variable is doing, okay? The rest is a trivial, trivial matter. But I have to keep these terms on, because I, I, they're important, you know, to, to match the physics and everything. <clears throat> okay, so, so what's going on? Let's look at this variable. So first, let me explain what's roughly going on. When epsilon goes to zero, I'm hitting the threshold 2 over gamma q minus alpha. And if I look at what's going on uh, around zero, I said it doesn't have a moment of order 2 over gamma q minus alpha. So this is making this expectation blow up. I'm hitting exactly the, the moment where, where it explodes. Okay? And so, and this guy plays no role at all, uh, roughly uh, around zero. Okay, and so I'm go you're going to admit, I'm going to let epsilon be zero here. It's not, this guy's playing no role. Epsilon is playing a role in the fact that the moment is blowing up. So I'm going to replace this guy here by, with epsilon equals zero. Okay, it's, it's pretty safe. safe. And if I do that, I have to study this variable. And this variable is I alpha plus some other term, which I don't know, I, I called it I prime. Okay, and what is I alpha? If x is less or equal, it's what, it's, it's this guy around zero, okay, where it's blowing up, and I alpha is, so roughly, so it's not roughly, it's actually equal, I alpha is going to be the integral for x less or equal to 1 of 1 over x to the power gamma alpha, m gamma Okay? And, and, it's, and it's I prime alpha. And in fact, if you, you can see that if you do a change of variable, x goes to 1 over x, you can believe me, it's symmetric. It has the same law as this guy. It's by conformal invariance. What's happening at infinity and around zero is the same thing. So rough, so alpha and I prime alpha, they have the same distribution. Okay? And here's the the main, main, main tool, the main theorem that I'm going to spend an hour on after, it's the following theorem. Theorem 3.3 in the lecture notes. The probability that I alpha is bigger than T, it's equal to some R ball, R uh, bar of alpha, 
plus an O, so something which is a constant over 2Q, 2 over gamma Q minus alpha plus eta, where eta is positive. So, of course, you know, it's, it, it, okay, this guy roughly, it, it, it is two, it's a sum of two variables, and you're hitting the threshold where the moment explodes. So what you want to do if you want to study this, you have to study the tails of this random variable, okay? And the main theorem I'm going to spend an hour on is this. So once you have this, what goes on, well, it's not, it's not very complicated, right? I mean, roughly, okay, this guy, he's, the tail of this is really concentrated around zero, okay, because the singularity is really adding some weight to the random variable. And so roughly these two guys are independent. Because, you know, if you're around zero or around infinity, you have a finite correlation, so the tails sum up, okay? So that's reasonable to believe that, you know, they have a fin there's a finite correlation between the two variables here. And so roughly, this implies, so let me say what this implies. It implies that, okay, how do, what do you do when you have two independent variables? Well, the, the tails, they just sum. So I get two R bar of alpha over T plus this O term, which is neglectable, okay? So, so we're done. This implies, okay, so I let you uh, take home exercise. This implies that if I multiply by epsilon, I have alpha. So it's a, a simple exercise in, in probability that this implies that this thing converges when epsilon goes to zero. I know everything now. I know completely the tails. So it converges to, so there's a, this is, there's a gamma here, but two gamma, two Q minus alpha over gamma, R bar of alpha. Okay. And so I think no one will complain. Uh, so if I know, the, the take home message is the moment is blowing up. It's blowing up because of a singularity in zero and in infinity. The two guys are roughly independent. So it, provided I know the tail of one of them, I know the tail of the sum. And so once I know the tail, uh, when I'm going to the threshold uh, where the moment doesn't exist, I can completely easily study what's going on. And, and, it's, and up to some you know, trivial terms, it's just the tail of the, the random variable. Okay, I think everything when we choose probability will find this, I hope, uh, completely clear. Okay, so everything, you know, every, you know, all the juice is contained in this theorem. But I start, first wanted to show you that, okay, it's just a question of moment blowing up. So the key is to understand the tail behavior of, 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 of GMC, Gaussian Multiplicative Chaos uh, Random Volume Forms. Okay. Excuse me, uh, do you actually need the eta? Uh, probably not. No. Uh, okay, I let you as an exercise. I don't think I need the, you know the eta positive here? Yeah, I mean, could it, could it just be a positive? No, yeah, I think it's, it should be true, yeah, if I have a little O. Uh, but okay, the eta is very important in our work because we need to analytically continue these moments. So I have, we have to take out poles. So I'm, I've, you won't see these in these lectures. It's, there are lots of technicalities like taking out poles of these guys. And if you want to take out poles, you need, a, you need control on the second bound. It's v these are b very important bounds in our work, but here, no, it's, it plays no role. But okay, I'm stating, uh, actually, anyways, I'm not going to prove you, you know, this term. I'm going to explain to you where this term comes from. Okay, so, uh, so this, so, so now I'm, I'm going to spend time on proving this. I'm going to give you a probabilistic expression for this. If I have a probabilistic expression for this, then I get a probabilistic expression for the R alpha here. Because R alpha at the end is, is going to be so, if I sum up everything, uh, let me just say what R alpha is. So at the end of the day, what is R alpha? This limit here, the reflection coefficient of Uville. <coughs> So R alpha is 
uh, 4 mu to the power 2 over gamma q minus alpha uh, gamma of minus 2 over gamma so the, the gamma function 2q minus alpha over gamma r bar of alpha where r bar of alpha is still a bit abstract for you guys but uh, I'll, I'll be discussing in a moment okay so that's the two-point correlation function of Uville. So now everything is about understanding this. Okay, and at the end, uh, you'll get an exact formula for, for this, which comes out of DOZZ as a corollary. Uh, so where's the mice here? Okay, so um, let me introduce uh, some, I, so now I have to describe this tail, so I have to introduce some, 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 some material, and so, all things that here people know rather well, I, I think, uh, but still have to, to refresh memories. It's the, the Williams, so let me start by introducing the, by recalling the Williams decomposition theorem. Okay, so what is the Williams decomposition theorem? So I think it's stated in the lecture notes as a, uh, as lemma 3.1, but I, it's hard to read. It's better to do a drawing, and that's what I'm going to do. So if I take, so I, I consider, okay. no, I can wander a bit more, let's say. So, so I consider a Brownian motion with a negative drift, a negative drift. So I, I look at a Brownian motion minus nu s and nu is positive, so I'm looking at a Brownian motion. And so it, so of course it, it goes to minus infinity at infinity. Even I remember this uh, stochastic calculus, so, uh, and of course it's going to hit a, it's going to hit a maximum. So if it goes to minus infinity, it's going to hit a maximum, so, and the maximum, m, so this is m, the maximum is the supremum of my Brownian motion, and, okay, it's a very known fact that the, the probability that m is bigger than x, so it's a, it's distributed like a, an exponential variable, so, the probability that m is bigger than x is exponential minus 2 nu, so nu is the drift, times it. So this is, okay, and so the Williams decomposition is the following thing. So I'm going to shift my curve here down and recenter it, okay, and, and so the Williams decomposition, it says that the following thing. So if I take, if I take that curve up there and I take the, around what's going on around the maximum, what do I get? So let me try to reproduce, a, I guess, okay, you get this and on the other side you get what? You get this. And so here, what do I have? I have, I have minus m, minus the maximum. And the Williams decomposition says that if I take a Brownian motion and I, I, I you know, I, I look at what's around the maximum, conditionally on the value of the maximum, uh, I get on this side, so I think I called it B2T, it's a drifted Brownian motion Conditioned, so it's a drifted round in motion, but of course it's, it's below zero, so it's conditioned to be negative, non-positive. So this is, you know, a standard diffusion which has been studied for years in, in, in probability. So I get a, con a drifted round in motion conditioned to be less or equal to zero. And on the other side, what do I get if I, 
if I look at things backward like this, I get the same thing, a drifted brown in motion conditioned to be negative. So uh, for all S positive, I'm negative. I get the same thing, except that I'm not looking at the full trajectory, I'm looking at the trajectory between zero and L minus M, and L minus M, well, you see, it's the last time, it's the last time that my drifted brown in motion hits minus M. So the take home message is when I decompose my trajectory on my brown in motion around the maximum, I first sample the maximum according to an exponential variable. And then if I, you know, if I recenter, what do I get on the right? I get a, a brown in motion condition to be negative with the same drift. And on the other side, if I look at it this way, I get the same thing, but I stop it at the last time it hits minus m. So that's the, the Williams, so that's the Williams decomposition uh, lemma that we're going to use. So quite naturally, I'm going to introduce uh, some, some, some definitions which I'm going to use uh, now in the sequel. I'm going to introduce, of course, okay, this, this picture but on, the, on R. I'm going to extend this everywhere and, and of course, you know, somehow what's going to happen is that I'm going to look at tail events so M is going to go to infinity and so naturally I'm going to have a two-sided drifted Brownian motion condition to be negative. So let me introduce some, some some notations. So here now I'm really following, uh, now I'm really following 3.2 tail expansion of GMC, page 12. Okay, so let me introduce the main, all the, the, main, the main guys of, of this tail. So I introduce, I think I, I don't know how I call this a, a matzkal B, so. So I'm going to introduce the two-sided drifted Brownian motion. So if S is negative, so B. So this is a straight B and this is a, a curvy B. <laughs> okay, B alpha S if S is positive. And B alpha S, um, I put a bar on this one, yeah. And B bar alpha to distinguish them are independent okay, so BM, so Brownian motions conditioned to be negative and with drift alpha minus Q. Or if in the picture that uh, I just wrote, I take, I take the drift to be minus nu with nu positive and nu is given by Q minus alpha. Okay, so these are two independent Brownian motions, so uh, conditioned to be non, with, with, with drift, so with drift and conditioned to be negative, to be less or equal to zero. Okay, so this is, okay, for those who know a bit of these stories, uh, when I'm going to study the exponential of the free field, there's going to be a radial part, and the radial part is going to be described by this, by, well, by this guy, sorry, and the non-radial part is going to be defined by what, you know, Duplantier Miller Sheffield called the lateral noise, and I'll introduce the lateral, the lateral noise right now. Somehow the lateral noise in all these businesses, what makes things kind of, you know, Simpler to study when you have two points is you have lots of symmetry and somehow the lateral noise plays no role. Essentially, you, you, can, all, you can state all the theorems on, on toy models where there's just a Brownian motion. And uh, essentially, the lateral noise plays no role, but we have to introduce it. So what is, the lateral noise is going to be the non-radial uh, non part of, 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 uh, of the Gaussian free field around zero. That will be the radial part which appears. So the lateral noise process, it's a Gaussian field with this covariance. 
So I'm going to switch to the cylinder. So the S is going to belong to R and theta is going to belong to 0, 2 pi. Okay? And, uh, uh, you know, the complex plane by a, uh, a conformal map is the same thing as a cylinder, R times a 0, 2 pi. So I'm going to introduce this guy. I'll, I'll explain in a moment. Uh, uh, we'll see why when, when this appears. But the lateral noise process, it's just a Gaussian field with a lock with this covariance. So I take the maximum of exponential minus x, exponential minus t, and I get this. And if I have this, you know, this thing defined on R times 0 to p, 2 pi, sorry, I can introduce the Gaussian chaos measure, the exponential of this guy. Oh, yesterday, uh, in the first lecture, sometimes I forgot the 2, but of course there's a 2 here, okay? This is a standard Gaussian chaos measure, and I'm going to be interested in slices on a, a fixed S. So I'm going to introduce this thing. So integrating this guy uh, on a, a slice with fixed S in my cylinder. So things will, will become quite clear, I hope, in, in a few so this is lateral noise process. So a way of constructing this thing is I take a Gaussian free field in the full plane. I take out the radial part. What do I get? If, I'm, if I map it to the cylinder, I get this guy here. OK? So, that's a, so this is a generalized notation because this thing can only, will only get, exist in the, in the space of, of distributions. What makes sense is integrating ZS against DS. It's not necessarily defined as a function, a slice. Okay, but I'm still going to use this notation. And a very important property of this, if I'm still with my abuse of notation as if it were a random function, it's a, it's a random generalized function. So, um, let me keep my alpha. Is that it's stationary? So if I if I if I translate this guy, you know, on the on the cylinder, it has the same distribution as if I okay. Okay, so I'm going to introduce uh, uh, did I did I erase the notation? I'm going to introduce rho of alpha, which is the limit in some sense of rho of alpha epsilon alpha, the, the random variable that's, that's blowing up. Now that I have all the material, I'm going to introduce rho of alpha. Okay, which this, this notation is, is, it should be seen kind of as, you know, the limit of, let's say, rho of alpha epsilon alpha as epsilon goes to zero in my, my picture. Uh, oh, it's, okay, it's, it's, it's written over up there. So it's this variable. So I take my two-sided drifted Brownian motion conditioned to be uh, negative with drift minus Q minus alpha, and I integrate it against the lateral noise process. And now I can introduce the tail, R bar of alpha. So R bar alpha is the expectation of rho of alpha to the power 2 over gamma q minus alpha. So here's my definition. Yes, it's a definition. 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 Okay. So, uh, let me give a, a, a 
No, it's not equal in law to rho alpha, zero alpha. No. No, no, no. It's, uh, it, you'll see in the proof, it's not, uh, if it were anyways, uh, no, no, because the expectation of rho alpha, zero alpha to the power two over gamma q minus alpha is infinity. It's blowing up. Whereas this guy, it's not. It, it, it's, it, why is this guy? Okay, let me explain. Uh, this thing here, what you should see, it's really, it's the same thing. So uh, it's the same thing as the exponential of a log correlated field with no singularity. You should really see this variable as kind of the exponential of a log correlated field with no singularity. This guy, okay, it's the exponential of a log correlated field so remember it's against dx but so never mind okay this is max of x and one so it's one inside this guy it's it's the exponential of a log correlated field you know when I say log correlated field it means it it, it, it explodes on the diagonal you know, it's log 1 over x minus 1. But it has a, a, a something blowing up around 0. And this guy here, and the blow up is due to the maximum over there, in fact. And when you condition the thing to be negative, you're, you're killing the singularity. And so, let me s stress once again, expectation of rho alpha, 0 alpha, 2 over gamma, q minus alpha. So maybe it's a bad notation, I don't know. Is worth infinity. That's the full point. You can't define two-point correlation. Now, here's something. Uh, here's something. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to admit, but uh, is that roughly okay? This guy, it's just an ordinary log correlated field with a, a, a divergence on a diagonal. Okay, so just like I said in the first lectures, when I when I integrate a log correlated field. It has a moment of order 4 over gamma square. This is, you know, set into stone, right? So if I take any interval included in R, the expectation of Zs of ds to the power p, which is equal to, you know, the expectation of my Gaussian, how did I call it in gamma? My Gaussian chaos measure integrated on the interval times 2 pi. This thing is finite. It's just an ordinary log correlated field if and only if p is smaller than 4 over gamma square. Okay? This is the, 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 important, the important thing. And what we're going to admit now is that since I'm integrating against ZSDS, not an interval, but with something that is, you know, really going fast to, to minus infinity and plus infinity, uh, which is going fastly to minus infinity uh, around this and around this, it's, it doesn't change the, the moment property. Okay? It doesn't change them. And so uh, what I want to say is that, uh, uh, <clears throat> what I want to say is that the moment that the expectation of rho alpha to the power p is finite just as with a, an ordinary exponential of, of, a, uh, of a Gaussian free field. And so in particular, this is a well-defined definition because 4 over gamma square is smaller than 2, uh, is bigger. 2 over gamma q minus alpha is smaller than 4 over gamma square if and only if alpha is bigger than gamma over 2. So I have a well-defined random variable here. Okay, so um, I think that uh, I'm going to take a two to three minute break because I've introduced uh, everything I need now. And so I think so you can digest a few minutes uh,
and maybe ask me questions. Uh, then we can start again in five minutes. Okay. So um, uh, I introduced uh, the material to understand. It's still written. It's going to be more transparent in a minute, I hope. I introduced the material to understand the tail of this variable. And I told you, okay, that in theorem 3.3, we proved this, and I introduced the R, bar, the R bar alpha, which works. Okay, and this is what I'm going to justify in this hour. Okay, but I had to introduce lots of material. Uh, and let me just say something again, which is all, all over the lecture notes, and I haven't justified, but uh, I don't know if I'll have time. If I take the exponential of a log correlated field and I integrate it on some open set, it has a moment of order p for all p smaller than 4 over gamma square. And since, you know, this lateral noise business is just a log correlated field, if I take a compact interval and I integrate, then I'm integrating the exponential of my log correlated field in some, okay, this is not an open set, but a compact set, sorry, in a compact set. This is a finite if and only if I have this. And the fact that here this guy is going very quickly to minus infinity when s goes to plus infinity and minus infinity, it, it says that roughly it's like integrating this exponential of log correlated field on a compact interval. Okay? So I hope this is, uh, this is clear. Okay, so let's, let's go. Theorem 3.3. So everything's going to be, I hope, clear on, on why, why this appears. So I'll say it in two languages. One which is very analytic and which, one maybe which is more geometric. So I, I'm, I want to study I alpha, remember I alpha up there? So I, my Gaussian free field has this covariance. This is the covariance of my Gaussian free field. It's log 1 over x minus y plus log x plus y plus and so x plus is the maximum of x and 1. So if I'm inside the ball of center 0 and radius 1, this, this thing disappears, right? This is worth 0 and this is worth 0. So inside the ball, my GFF, it's, I'm t I can take out this term. Okay, now the expectation, so I'm going to do a change of variable. I'm mapping my complex, my, my ball of radius 1 and center 0 to a, to, to a cylinder. So it's not a cylinder, it's a half cylinder. Now if I look at the covariance, it's nothing but this and it's this. The minimum of, F, of S and T plus log of this. This is a straightforward straightforward computation. Uh, okay? This is straightforward. This is uh, I'm just uh, this plus log of the upstairs here is, is zero. Okay, so I see that so if I'm writing it at the level of covariance, but if you, you want it in a more geometric picture, you take your Gaussian free field, you take the radial part, so this corresponds to taking, this is the covariance of the radial part of my Gaussian free field. And this so the covariance of the radial part is this, and plus the covariance of the lateral noise. Okay, so I did it as a simple computation, or you can see it geometrically. I take my Gaussian free field, I project it on the circle of radius exponential minus s, and, and uh, what's left is an, is an independent Gaussian field which has covariance this, the, la the, the, the lateral noise. Okay, and of course everyone recognizes here this is Brownian motion. So this guy, the radial part is distributed like a Brownian motion. Okay, so now, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, comp I'm going to do a change of variable in I of alpha and, 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 and see Brownian motion and lateral noise appear and, and then take the, 
the limit. So, so let's go. I of alpha is the integral for x less or equal to 1. Okay? So I'm going to do the full computation at a formal level, but if you want to justify it rigorously, you just add cutoffs here and then make them go to zero. So I'm doing my change of variable. I, I set x, x minus s e i theta. So I get what? Integral of zero to plus infinity. So I get a Jacobian minus 2s because there's, you know, there's, if I do radial, it's r dr d theta, and since I'm taking an exponential, I get a 2 here. So it's a standard. This guy becomes exponential of gamma alpha s. And I get, of course, Okay, so let me emphasize that it's very important to always write this explicitly, this guy here. You know, this hidden normalization. If you don't, you're going to end up saying something false. So now I decompose my x over there, okay? It's the sum of two independent parts. So I'm going to call this bs, by the way. So th this is my, my bs, my Brownian, so it's a Brownian motion, right? With uh, this covariance. So I get... So x is a Brownian motion plus an independent guy. So I get integral 0 plus infinity, exponential minus 2s. So there's a typo, by the way. I wrote alpha s in the notes, and there's a typo. It's a, there's a gamma in front. OK? And I, so, so still going a bit, a bit slowly, I'm going to write things explicitly. This. I get exponential gamma, my Brownian motion, minus, you know, the term that comes out of this, times the lateral noise. Okay? And so at the end of the day, if I, you know, if I put all these terms in S together, so recall that q is gamma over 2 plus 2 over gamma. I get the integral of exponential gamma, a Brownian motion with drift minus q minus alpha, times, and I integrate over d theta, so zs ds. So remember, I, I wrote it here. Zs is integrating my lateral noise on a slice. So I get this expression. So this is the very, ex this is the very important expression, the key thing, where you see how this guy is going to appear already, right? Okay? Because, you know, the Brownian motion is going to have, a, we're going to zoom around the maximum, and we're going to see these two, these two parts, uh, the two-sided guy appear here. Okay, so let me continue. Whoa. Yeah. I hope I. Okay. So so now I, I use the Williams decomposition, which I erased, and it says this. So the integral, so now my Brownian motion, of course, it has a maximum. So I'm going to, so it's equal in, in distribution or in law, okay. To what? 
So I take out, I take out the maximum, so exponential gamma m, so where m here is the, the maximum of this guy, this Brownian motion. And so if I, if I shift, I get minus L minus M plus infinity exponential gamma of my curly set of S plus L minus M dS. So I take the supremum of my re radial part, you know, my drifted ra minus the drift that appears naturally. So I, and I saw the Williams decomposition says that if I look around the maximum, what do I get on the right? I get this, this drifted Brown in motion condition to be negative. And on the left, I get the same thing up to the, the first time, the last time it hits minus M. Now here, Remember, this guy is independent from this guy, okay? The lateral noise is independent from this Brownian motion. So it's, in this picture, I'm shifting, but this, is, this guy is independent of this guy, and it's stationary. So I'm allowed to take out the shift here. So it's equal, in law, to exponential gamma m integral minus l minus m plus infinity of exponential gamma B alpha S, Z of S, DS. Okay, so uh, now, uh, now, now we're almost there, right? So let me make a, a few, uh, so this is the variable we have to study. Um, so the variable is this. Okay. So this is this is i of alpha, right? So, so it's, it, i of alpha is equal and lot to this. So let let me call this variable. Okay, it's it's i of alpha. So, but it, it's in distribution. So what does it say? It says that this i of alpha, I can I can have this trivial bound. It's less than minus infinity of. So this is rho of alpha. It's clearly below, okay, and it's clearly <coughs> above this. Okay, so what is what is what is not? Uh, exponential gamma. Okay, but what is nice here is that these tails are obvious, right? This is this guy here. The maximum, well, I know the ma this is an exponential variable with parameter uh, q minus alpha, 2 q minus alpha. So in fact, this is completely explicit. This is equal to 1 over t to the power 2 gamma q minus alpha. This is, there's no other terms here. It's, it's, it's an exponential variable. It's completely explicit. And this guy here, well, it's independent. And this guy here is independent. And so, I have a random, so I have a random variable here which has a tail of this form, and I have a, an independent variable here which has a tail of the form 1 over t to the power, okay, at least it, it has a tail which is smaller than 1 to the t over p for all p less than 4 over gamma square. So it's trivial, you have two independent variables, it's a, it's a, it's a scaling argument, so this guy here, so this is rho of alpha, the tail of this guy, well, by a simple scaling, it's nothing but equal to the expectation of rho of alpha 2 gamma over q minus alpha. Uh, divided by t2 over gamma q minus alpha. Okay, up to some little correction because this is only valid if t is, uh, is bigger than 1. Okay, so and this, these two guys are independent, so I, I wrote this probability as t over this, and then I apply my scaling, they're independent, I get this. Right? 
What? No, not yet. I'm saying I get this, I get this. If I look at this guy, I get the same thing, except that I don't get, I don't get whole of alpha. I, I get, okay, half, let's say, this. But what am I saying? I'm just saying that the tail of this guy, it's clearly a constant between, uh, it's, it's clearly between two constants, 1 over t to the power 2. Okay, so now it's easy. Because look at this, so this is I of alpha, okay? So what happens when I look at the tail? If I say m is bounded, then if m is bounded, I'm going to end up with a tail here, which is of this order. So if I look at the probability that this guy is big, necessarily m is big. So if m is big, this means that uh, I of alpha, if, if, if I of alpha is big, roughly on this event, I of alpha, it really looks like m has to be big. So it looks like this guy integrated. So if m is big, then this is minus infinity. And so what I'm saying, what I tried to argue, and I didn't give you all the technical details, but I argued that on the event that this tail is very big, it, 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 on this guy is very big, it looks like exponential gamma m, and I replace m by infinity here, times the whole of alpha. And so at the end, if you work a bit, you just have to control a bit, you know, what's going on with if m is not very big, and, and you can actually get even bounds, uh, you know, that I, uh, you know, correction terms. And so this explains why uh, I erased it, but at the end of the day, if you sum up these considerations, I get that this guy is big, is roughly, you know, the whole of alpha divided by t over 2 over gamma q minus alpha. Okay. And so you work, you get, you get the second bound, etc., the second order. Okay, so I think that uh, this explains why, uh, uh, why you see the, these kinds of objects. And um, so let me, let me explain, okay, what, why, why do we call this, uh, oh, I'm, what time is it? I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I'm going almost too quick, but uh, I wanted to, 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 to show this in, in great detail. And uh, so let me recall what the, the, the quantum sphere is. <coughs> the alpha quantum sphere. So. Ah, I'm erasing exactly the wrong thing. <laughs> So this is the definition of, let me not erase this, sorry. Okay, so what is the, so I have my measure here, so why do I say this is the, the partition function? It's because So definition, so let me call this like the alpha quantum sphere. Uh, so alpha quantum sphere and so Duplantier Miller Sheffield. They, took, they considered only the case alpha equals gamma, but uh, okay, it's a, so the alpha quantum sphere is, is going to be the following random measure defined up to translations in, on, on the cylinder. So it's going to be the measure, if I take a function defined on measures, then the alpha quantum sphere, well, it's, it's exactly the measure, it's the measure associated to this guy. Okay, or no, it's going to be the measure f of, so the unit volume one. So I take my, my lateral noise GMC measure and I multiply, multiply by exponential the two-sided drifted Brownian motion condition to be negative and 
I divide it, so I want a unit volume guy, I divide it by total mass, okay? By rho alpha. Rho alpha is, okay, rho alpha is this guy, it's the total mass. So I, if I integrate this on the cylinder, I get one. It's unit volume, and, but it's in, very important that it has an extra term here, uh, a radon nicodym derivative, which is this, which is the total mass, Okay, and so if I want this to be a probability measure, then I have to divide by, so remember, this is r bar, r -bar of alpha. And so, okay, it's, it's very natural to, to interpret the unit volume as the partition function of the, of the alpha quantum sphere. Okay. So I, 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 I wanted to give this definition because I, I realized that for most people it was not clear uh, that there was this term here in the definition. There's a, 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 a radon nicodym derivative. It's not just, you know, this radial part which I've conditioned to be negative times the lateral noise. It's also there's a radon nicodym derivative which comes out naturally. And, uh, so, and so what you really have to understand is that the mating of trees paper, it's, it's really constructing random volume forms uh, uh, associated to Uville conformal field theory with two mark points, one at zero, one at infinity. Okay, and okay, what I did today is I showed you how you, you construct, you know, the partition function, so the two-point correlation function out of the three-point correlation function, but similarly, I mean, you can take, so we, we constructed, so I, I I give a definition in lecture three. Uh, we give, I gave a definition in, in lecture three. I, in, in, in the same way, if you, if you take the three-point, the Uville volume form associated to the three-point correlation of Uville, something we've constructed, if you, you take a, a weight a alpha, alpha, epsilon, you're going to converge to a random measure in the space of quantum surfaces, and it's going to be this. So you can also, what I did for the two-point correlation function, you can also very easily lift it to the a convergence of random measures, okay? So uh, this is nice because it, it really, you know, it shows how really the link between the two works and, and uh, it had to be that way. They have two marked points, so it's, uh, it's the Liouville two-point correlation function. Okay, so I've been, I, I, I realized that I still have some time so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe I'm going to explain to you uh, one, one, one or two points uh, that, can, that I admitted on the moments of order P. And then probably, I don't know, if it's a problem if I finish a bit earlier than expected. I'm... C'est très bien. <laughs> okay. But is it, I hope it's clear, all this that I'm saying. That, uh, Okay, so let me, um, yes, so uh, let me ex explain something in a very simple way, something that I've been admitting in, in lecture one and lecture two. I'm not going to exactly prove this, but uh, something I use very often is this bound four over gamma square. So, so imagine I take some, some let's say some ball of center x and radius r, and I always, I told you something which is important is that, so if, I, if I integrate the free field, say on an, I told you that this is finite I take, of course, gamma in 0, 2. This is finite if and only if p is smaller than 4 over gamma square. So let me try to explain to you where this 4 over gamma square can be seen very easily. Okay, so I, I use this uh, very often. So this is maybe a little digression. So, I, so let me do the following thing. So of course, this, this will not depend uh, so say, say I'm, 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 I'm not, forget about the other terms, they play no role. Let's say I have a nice Gaussian, 
log correlated field here. Okay, so of course this will not depend on R. I mean, if you show it for one, one open set, it's true on all of them. You just cover them and it's... So I want to explain what, how you can see in a three, three line computation where this comes from. Okay. So, uh, well, you do it like this. Take a square. So I'm going to integrate, on, so this is a square, uh, I'll call it C, and I can cut it into four squares, okay? And so the integral over the square of my exponential, I, of course I can write it as the sum on the four subsquares, okay? And so if I take p bigger than 1, by superadditivity, I have that the integral on the square well, it's greater or equal to the sum of these on the subsquares to the power p. And so by, this is a stationary process, okay, so it's so it's bigger than the sum, so remember, x plus y, well, I don't know, to the power p, so a plus b, say, because this is a variable, a plus b to the power p is greater than, if p is greater than 1. Uh, so I get this on each square, and by stationarity I get 4, expectation on the square, so exponential gamma x, etc., to the power p. So this is a, this is obvious. So these are not in the lecture notes, so I, I can put them. Okay, now the integral over 0, 1 half Okay, what is this? I do a change of variable. So x is, one, is u over 2, and I get what? So this creates a 1 over 2, so wait, a dx, du, that's 1 over 2 squared, so I get 1 over 2. Integral on the, on the initial square, okay, so on the initial square, x to u, uh, x is u over 2, yeah, minus gamma square. And once again, what I'm doing here on a formal level you can do it rigorously, you just put a cutoff here, you do all my stuff, and you go to the limit. Okay, now, uh, now let's look at this guy. The covariance of this guy is log, so I was playing around with these relations 10 years ago when I started GMC theory, and I, I really love these little manipulations, so I hope you'll <laughs> You'll like it too. It's it's this. So it's log two plus log one over u minus v. So what does it mean? It means that this guy it has the same distribution as x u, the initial guy, plus a random variable, okay, a log variable with centered and with variance log over two. Okay. I'm just uh, so this guy, it has the same distribution as my 
initial guy, so 1 over 2 squared, exponential a Gaussian variable minus its variance times the integral over uh, the square, but this time of not xu over 2, but xu. So my initial guy. Now, now I plug it. So I plug this inequality. This guy integrated on the square is bigger than four times the same guy integrated on this, the on the the c1 square. But I know that integrated on this the the first square c1, I can relate it. It's the same thing as the initial guy times an independent Gaussian variable. So let's see. Let's plug this in. So I get that the expectation of the guy on the standard square, so C, well, to the power P is greater or equal to 4. So what is this guy? I get 1 over 2, 2 to the power 2P. I take this guy, I get exponential of so gamma square p square over 2 log 2, okay? Minus gamma square 2p times the same thing. So integrating over p. So of course if I want this to be compatible, I have to check that this thing has to be uh, less or equal to 1. Otherwise the moment is infinite. I mean it's a contradiction. So let me write it. So for those who, so you're going, actually going to see the, you know, the, the KPZ formula here. This is the KPZ formula on Hausdorff dimensions, if you like. It's the way the measure scales when you, you start zooming in. So what is this? Uh, if I, if I, you know, if I, if I put this, uh, this is equal to 2 to the square minus zeta p. Z of p, okay, so I get expectation of my business to the power p greater or equal to the same thing to the power p times 2 to the power 2 minus z to p, where z to p is equal to 2 plus gamma square over 2 p minus gamma square over 2 p square. So the KPZ, quadratic KPZ relation. Okay, and you can check that zeta of 4 over gamma square is equal to 2. Comp take home computation. So it means that if p is above this guy, okay, what does zeta look like? So it's a concave. Not get this wrong. Something like this. And then it starts going back down, etc. And And uh, what it says is that uh, zeta p is going to be. Uh, uh, wait a second. Yeah, it's uh, for four over gamma squared. It's starting to go down. So if you're above, then this is going to be greater or equal to one. Okay. So that explains the this thing here. It explains the threshold. And um, uh, that that we've been that I've been using all, all along. It's a very simple, you know. Scaling argument, and and actually, let me let me finish with a, a few minutes by explaining roughly by the same kind of trick. I'm going to explain why, if gamma is bigger than two, the measure is zero. Okay, so I mean I, I hope this is useful. I think you can really explain very easily these thresholds. Uh, so I'm going to explain now why. Gamma has to be smaller than two. It's the same kind of ideas. Okay. So I, I've already done some job here. So so I introduce zeta of alpha two plus gamma square over two. So I, I introduce my quadratic relation, you know, 
which is the way the measures the moment scale around the when you zoom in around the point. Now if gamma is bigger than 2, zeta prime of 1 is negative. Okay? Zeta prime of alpha is equal to 2 plus gamma square over 2 minus gamma square alpha. So it's easy to see that zeta prime is negative, and I have zeta of 1 equals uh, 2. OK. So this means that zeta, if gamma is bigger than 2, then zeta is like this. So here there's 2, and it's doing this. So zeta is a, is a concave function. Zeta of 1 is obviously 1, that's trivial, uh, is obviously 2, that's trivial. And if I take the derivative of zeta prime, gamma bigger than 2 is equivalent to the derivative at 1 being negative. So it means that I'm, I'm, I'm like this. Okay, so this means that I can find alpha strictly smaller than 1 such that zeta alpha is strictly bigger than 2. OK? Now, now if I take, I do the same thing, alpha strictly less than 1, I can use subadditivity, right? This is true. And so I do the same game. I take my square, okay, and I cut it into little squares size 1 over 2 to the power n, okay? So I, I can cut it into squares. So into 2 to the n, so I cut it into little squares of size 1 to the 2 to the power n, and I have 2, uh, so I have 2 to the 2n of these squares, right? Chopping it into little pieces. And I, do the, I can do the same thing, but in the other way around. It's sub-additive, it's not super-additive, it's alpha. And what do I get? I get that if I integrate the measure on my, my square, to the power alpha, I'm going to get less or equal to 2 to the 2n, and I'm going to get 1 to the 2n zeta alpha. Because in each square I, I, I scale like, and so since zeta alpha is strictly bigger than 2, I can choose 1. I let n go to infinity, and I get 0. So this shows that gamma over 2 is the right, is really the threshold where the thing starts to become uh, 0. And it also, these little manipulations explain to you uh, why the mo when I take the a lot correlated field, I get this bound p uh, smaller than 4. It's just looking at scaling properties around the measure. And uh, for those who know, uh, this, is, this zeta p is really behind you know, the geometric KPZ relations. Okay, so I, I'm going to stop here. I, I finished a bit early, but I hope that uh, you don't mind. Um, I mean, uh, it's just that I, I could go in lecture three, but I think it's not a good idea, right? Okay, thank you. Just one question. Ah. So he corresponds with the quantum uh, sphere. There was a paper by Haru. Uh, young and sun, yes. And just appear in CMT. Yes. So did they do exactly what you showed today? No, they did. They did something different. They said, oh, "I erased it." They say, "If I take a gamma quantum sphere, basically when you have a two-point, you can construct a three-point with the same values of the alphas." So what you construct is exponential. Okay, roughly what? Okay, in the language of of. Um, 
let's say, of, of correlations, what you can, the alpha quant, the gamma, oh, okay, you take alpha equal gamma. So the gamma quantum sphere is this, and you can, by picking a point, you can construct the three-point correlation function with gamma, gamma, gamma. That's essentially the, the message of their, their paper. In the language, so you, but you can only construct the three-point with the same weights, exactly the same weights. So that, that's kind of the take-home message. So what they did is they did, uh, they take a quantum sphere with alpha equals gamma, so it only works for alpha equal gamma. You take the, the quantum sphere with alpha equal gamma, you pick a point randomly on the sphere, you map it back to the complex plane, to one, say, then you can, you'll have the same distribution as the Liouville volume form that we construct uh, by t t putting uh, three weights, gamma, gamma, gamma. So it's, what, what, I, what I said today, it's, it's kind of the, the other way. You take three points, you want, make one disappear, you converge to the quantum sphere. You can pick a point on the quantum sphere to, to construct a, 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 a measure with weight gamma, gamma, gamma. Okay. Yes? Yeah, about the real motion, the like alpha condition. Yeah. So you can write it as a solution of uh, a stochastic differential equation, if you yes. want. Yes. Um, but you are not using that in your calculations. Here? Yeah. No, 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 no. You don't care about exactly what this process is? Uh, no, you, 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 what's really important is that, um, okay, the main, th what is very important is that the, the, the random variable, uh, it has to, you know, it has a moment of order p for all p less than 4 gamma square. Essentially what we, what is very important is that if I take my two-sided Brownian motion, so I forget about, you can forget about lateral noise, it plays no role. What you really need, what we do need, and you can use, yeah, comparisons, theorems, and stochastic differential equations to get this. What you really need is that this guy, he's really going very fast to minus infinity on both sides. And so you can use stochastic calculus for comparisons. That's, that's where you can use this, yeah. But you, okay, on some technical details, you can, you, you use it, actually. But it goes faster than the brain motion district. Yes, much faster because he can't, he can't go get a maximum. Okay. Ah. So you calculate certain moment of uh, rho alpha uh, in order to, to determine the log. Ah. So no. Oh, sorry. Of course, you. It's a good question. Uh, I, I I forgot to say something. So. Uh, I, if I may take two minutes, uh, just to answer. Uh, um, what I forgot to, to say is, oh, I'm, I have, okay, so, let me just take one, one minute, sorry. It's a good, it's, it's related to your question, and it, it made me say that, so what, what I proved today is that for, 2q minus alpha over gamma. The gamma function, so this, so the unit volume guy, so this is the, the partition function, if you want, of the quantum sphere. I showed that this was the limit as epsilon goes to zero of C gamma alpha epsilon alpha. Okay, this is, I took an hour and a half and I proved this today. Now remember, we proved the DOZZ formula. So as a corollary of the DOZZ formula, and this is kind of answering your, some of your question, as a corollary of the, of the DOZZ formula, we can take the limit in DOZZ here, and we're going to get that, since we know how to compute this, we know how to compute this, and this is worth, just let me write it because it's, it's you know, it appears, it's worth this. Oh, there's a mu here. It's worth minus pi mu, so uh, the L function is the ratio of gamma functions. So it's a much easier formula. It's called the reflection coefficient you know, formula. But to answer your question, so this is the corollary of the DOZZ theorem. You get an ex explicit value for 
the two-point correlation function. So it's much easier. It's only four gamma functions. Okay. But you don't get the law, right? Okay, so this term is completely explicit. So if you, you, you just take out the gammas, uh, this one and this one, the mu, etc., you get this moment. So it's r roughly three gamma function. But it doesn't give you the law because the alpha here is linked to the alpha in the power. So the, 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 the theorems that we get you know, on, on the sphere, on the Riemann sphere, up to now, they, they, they don't enable to get the full law of the random variable because the moment is linked to the definition of the law itself. However, what's interesting is that uh, what our PhD students are doing is, is looking at the circle uh, or, or the disk. And in these cases, you can completely characterize the law in some situations, like in the fyodorov bouchot formula I, I discussed. But no, you, you, you get the moment is linked to the definition of the variable. 